Um, welcome to our What's On at EVGU uh, webinar. Um, it's now 11 days from this year's virtual assembly. Um, so we'll be looking through some of the content attendees can expect and what to consider when planning a program. My name is Simon Clark. I'm the EGU's Committee Programs Coordinator. And today's structure, we have uh, two speakers, a slight change in the program. After all speakers have finished, we'll have a QA and a session. Um, if you have a question, uh, please enter it by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. In that tab, you can also upvote questions. Um, the questions with the most votes are likely to be asked to the panelists. Uh, we will try to get through all questions uh, during this session. Um, just to let you know, this webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is Eurogea Services. Uh, so following from that, I'm just going to introduce our guest speakers for today. Uh, our first speaker is Chloe Hill, who is the EGU Policy Officer. She is also the convener of multiple union symposia, short courses, and networking sessions. Um, and our second speaker for the Slight Change program is uh, Jenny Turton, who is the incoming Deputy Unified ECS representative today. Um, so, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chloe to discuss uh, subjects and policy. Great, thank you so much, Simon. Um, so hi to everyone. As Simon mentioned, I am the EGU's Science for Policy Officer or just Policy Officer. Um, and I will be running a couple of different science and policy activities throughout the General Assembly this year. Um, and today during my presentation, I'm just gonna talk firstly about what science and policy is because I know some of you listening today um, might not have heard the term before. Um, secondly, about why you should come to these sessions, why you should want to learn more about science and policy. And then I'll just be sharing a few of the different sessions that um, we'll be running throughout the General Assembly. So to do this, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint, which I'm going to do now. So firstly, like I said, what is science for policy? Um, science of policy is the process of transferring information or knowledge or research from the scientific community or an individual researcher to policymakers with the intention to create evidence-informed policy. Now, evidence-informed policy is ideally the result of science of policy. This is a policy or a decision that is guided by evidence. Now, evidence is just one component of any policy decision, but from my perspective, it is an important component um, and it helps policymakers to find the pathway that has the most beneficial outcomes. So this is a, a very theoretical sort of description and I don't expect that you understand what science or policy is with these two sentences, but if you do want to learn more about what it is, come to one of the sessions that I'm about to talk about. Um, and there's a couple of other reasons why you might want to come to these sessions too. So some of the benefits of actually being a scientist who engages with policy um, are also on the screen. I'm going to talk about some of those now. So these are reasons why you might want to come to some of the sessions I'm about to talk about and learn a bit more about what science or policy is and how you as a scientist can engage with the policymaking process. So the first one is to assist in evidence-informed policymaking that benefits society. So a lot of, um, a, a lot of scientists actually really want their their research to have some sort of impact that's beneficial for society. Um, and, and one way of doing this is actually sharing your research with policymakers um, and telling them how they can make these decisions in a way um, that has the, the least negative um, results. So this is one reason why scientists do engage in science policy. Another one is to is less altruistic, but is to increase the impact of your research. So when we are publishing research in journals, a lot of the time, the only people who read the research that's published in a scientific journal are our colleagues, so other scientists who are researching the same area as us. Um, and very often, if it's not communicated to a broader audience, it won't be seen by the public and it won't be seen by policymakers. And the impact is really within the scientific community. Um, and of course, you know, we, we add to the knowledge of humanity, which is great, but there's a lot of other ways in which you and your research can have an impact in society. And that might be through um, sharing it with the public in a, in a broad sense, in a way that um, they can understand. So limited amounts of scientific jargon, but it also might be with policymakers. So that is another 
um, motivation for a lot of scientists. Now, the third one I have here is to expand your network and opportunities. So once you start engaging with policy, you're going to meet a lot of different people. We're not just policymakers, but other stakeholders, people who are working in the private sector, um, people who are working with NGOs. Um, and once you start meeting these people and seeing the opportunities that exist, you uh, have many doors open for you. So that is another reason that you might want to engage in science or policy and another reason why you might want to learn more about it. So how can you learn more about it? You can attend these sessions. So I'm going to present a few different sessions. Um, I'm starting out with the union wide sessions. So in this case, it's union symposia and it's great debates. These are the two I think are most policy relevant. Both of these have policymakers speaking in them um, and you can join them to see how geoscience connects with different policy issues. So the first one is integrating geoscience into the European Green Deal. Now the Green Deal is a really hot topic in policy right now, but it's also um, really, connected with the geosciences in a lot of different ways. So the Green Deal talks a lot about climate change, for example, mitigating climate change, a lot about biodiversity. Um, and there, you know, you can connect it with soil biodiversity, you can connect it with pollution and all of this kind of thing. Um, and there's a huge range of topics where geoscientists are actually really important. Um, and the second one is a climate emergency and ecological emergency, how the pandemic can help save us. So this particular session will look at um, how scientists how we as, as a scientific community have reacted to the pandemic um, and you know how we've actually communicated the issues to the public to policymakers what we've done really well as a scientific community and what we haven't done so well and what we where we can improve when we're communicating about other crises such as the climate emergency um, and both of these sessions will have policymakers in them so um, there'll be a couple from the commission um, David Ma from the Joint Research Centre of the Commission, um, as well as Andrea Hinwood, who is a um, who is the chief scientist for the United Nations Environment Program. So some quite high level policymakers will be there, um, and you will actually have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. So the vast majority of these of these two union symposia will be presentations. You'll be hearing from policymakers and from scientists who engage with policy, but you'll also be able to ask some questions towards the end. So if you do want to have more of an interactive perspective, I recommend these short courses. So I'm sure if you're um, attending this presentation, you've probably been to a general assembly before. You probably know there's a lot of different types of sessions. There's scientific sessions where you present your research. There's these union-wide sessions that are quite high level, but then there's also short courses. And short courses are really, really great for um, expanding your skill set. They might not necessarily be exactly on your area of expertise or your area of research, but they will help you develop in other ways. So these are the three that I think probably relate to science of policy the most. Um, the first one is your handbook to science for policy. And this session directly relates to the handbook that you can see on the side here. Now this handbook was written last year by the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And if you haven't already taken a look at it, I really do recommend it. Um, it's hugely beneficial. It is free online. There's a bunch of chapters. It's really long. Um, but basically this session invites two of the authors, so Martha and Lena, to present on a couple of the chapters that they think is, uh, will be most relevant to EGU members. So they'll be presenting on, you know, how you can interact more effectively with policymakers um, and what scientists need to look out for. So this, this particular um, session will obviously have a couple of presentations, but we'll also be very focused on Q&A. So you can come along and ask people who have written this handbook your own questions and have them answered. Um, the second one is how to influence policy through engaging with parliaments. Now, again, this one is quite interactive, um, but it will focus on the parliament rather than the commission as in the previous um, short course I mentioned. Now, the, the commission and the parliament are two separate policy entities and both have very different opportunities and different methods for engaging with science or policy. So if you're a scientist, you can engage with both of these different institutions, but in very different ways. So this one really focuses on the parliaments and we'll, again, we'll have two guest speakers, one coming from the UK parliament, from the UK Knowledge Exchange, uh, Exchange Unit, and the other will be coming from STOA, which is the European Parliament's um, panel on science, basically, and they try and work with scientists to get more science into policy. So they'll be presenting on how scientists can interact better with the parliament and a couple of the opportunities that exist for you to do that. 
And the third one there is more broadly um, about communication. Of course, this is also relevant for when you're communicating with policymakers, but it's also relevant if you are talking to the public. So those are the three I would recommend. Now, these are all linked in a policy blog that I'll put in the chat after I finish presenting. Um, so if you have any questions about these, obviously you can ask, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, but I'll also link a, a blog post that has a bit more details about all of these sessions once I finish speaking. Okay, so the third thing I want to just uh, talk about quickly are the networking sessions. Now, these networking sessions are something that's quite new and quite unique to this General Assembly and something I'm really, really excited about. Um, these networking sessions are the opportunity for you to actually meet other EGU um, participants as well as experts. Um, and they're very interactive. So instead of being a webinar format like we have today, there'll be a, mostly there will be a Zoom meeting format. So you'll be able to talk to each other. You'll have the opportunity to turn your own microphone on um, and really get into some discussions. The first one I have listed here, all of these are in the second week of the General Assembly as well. So at the same time that you'll be maybe presenting your research. Um, the first one I have listed here is the Science of Policy Meet and Greet. Now this session will have 10 science of policy experts that have been hand selected by me um, to come in and to talk to you in small breakout, breakout rooms about what they do at the science of policy interface um, and answer your questions that you have. So this is the aim of this session is really so that you can meet some of these people, but also so you can meet others who are also interested in engaging and sort of bounce off each other. It's only for an hour, um, but I hope it'll be very relaxed, very informal, um, and just a good way to meet some of these people. The second one will focus on the EGU's Science and Policy Pairing Scheme. This is an annual pairing scheme that the EGU does every year that supports an EGU member going into the European Parliament for a week or a couple of days um, and actually working directly with an MEP and their team. So we actually have two of our um, former uh, pairing scheme members joining us for this panel discussion and they'll talk about some of their experiences, the lessons they learned, um, how they think they could have potentially um, you know, improved their experience and things like that. And we're also hoping to have someone from the parliament side as well, although that's not confirmed yet. Um, and this will also give you the opportunity to talk with them and ask your own questions as well. Um, and if you are interested in participating in this pairing scheme, I'd really recommend that you attend this session so you can learn a little bit more about it. Um, and the third one we have here is just pitching your uh, policy ask to a policymaker. Um, so this one is, again, run by both um, someone from STOA and someone from the UK Parliament directly after the short course on the previous slide. And this will actually be more of a workshop. So you'll be able to ask your own questions, but you'll also be asked to bring a you know, pen and paper or just your computer screen um, so that you can actually work through some of your policy asks and how you would go about doing that. Um, so the, the overarching aim of all of these is to meet and interact with those on the interface of science and policy, get practical tips, work out how you can put them into practice, um, and to have your questions answered. The second final thing I just want to mention quickly is another opportunity that we're piloting this year. Never has it been done before, and I'm quite excited about it, um, but it's pairing people up. So you as scientists, as members, as people who are attending our General Assembly with an expert who is working at the Science and Policy Interface. Um, now this is, we're going to see how we go with this. There will be limited spaces, but essentially uh, there is a submission form, which I'll also link in the chat that you can use. Um, and you will submit your questions in here. I will take a look at the questions you have and try to find the right expert to answer those questions. And once I've paired you up, I'll try and find a time that suits both of you. Um, and you can have a 15 minute Zoom meeting with this person and just have a chat with them. It's a really good way of getting to meet um, someone who's working interface and maybe, you know, make that connection for later on. It's also a really good way to get some personalized advice um, because a lot of the time in these sessions, we do talk quite generally about you know, tips that are useful for everyone. But if you want some more individualized advice, you can ask these questions. Um, please do submit them before April 14th. Um, if you can do it sooner, do it sooner because there are a limited number of spots, obviously. Um, and once we've reached that limit, we won't I won't be able to take any more. So do, um, as I said, I'm going to put that link in the chat. Um, you'll be able to read more about it and you'll also be able to submit your questions. 
final thing is regardless of what division you are in take a look at some of the scientific sessions that also focus on policy there are actually quite a few of them um, this is just sort of three examples that i picked out um, that might be of interest to you if you are you know in natural hazards for example or if you're a hydrologist um, and add them to your personal program because we do have a function on the program where you can star different sessions and create a personal program that way so that if you can't remember the sessions that you liked you can just click that button and you can go directly to the list that you selected earlier um, so that is all from me and yeah i'll pass back over to simon excellent uh thank you chloe for that um so i'm gonna quickly move on to our next speaker who is Jenny Turton, for discussing ECS oriented activities and events at the Assembly. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah, my name's Jenny, and I'm one of the early career science representatives at EGU. And I'm going to try and give you some ideas of what events are out there for early career scientists specifically. So firstly, what is an early career scientist? Um, if you're a student, a PhD candidate, or a practicing scientist who received your highest certificate or degree, in the last seven years, you are classed as an early career scientist and where appropriate, we can extend this seven year period for things such as parental leave, um, disabilities and the other things listed here. Um, I am currently the um, division representative for the cryosphere, but starting in April, I will then become the deputy union level representative taking over from Anita and she will then take over from Anouk as the incoming union level representative. So for the next two-ish years, you'll see our faces around EGU. And if you want to get in contact with us, please email us at ecs at egu.eu. Each of the 22 scientific divisions at EGU have at least one representative. And this is the way that you can communicate your um, requests or ideas for how EGU can better represent you. And if you don't know who your representative is, I recommend that you find out on egu.eu slash ecs slash representatives. The early career scientists make up around 50% of the attendees at the General Assembly, and we've been increasing in numbers over the last few years. And now we can even see which sessions we're involved with and which might be interest, an interest for you with the ECS logo that you can see just here. Um, this logo is also used for highlighting which sessions are convened by early career scientists, so that if you wanted to convene a session, that would be something you could do in the future. So what is there to do during the conference that isn't related specifically to your science? And there are a number of different options that I'll run through from short courses, networking, great debates, career development opportunities, and of course, just some fun events to attend. There are some interesting short courses, particularly for first timers and early career scientists. So the first one, if you're maybe new to EGU, you've maybe not been to a conference before, is how to navigate EGU tips and tricks. Um, and this is on the first Monday at 9am. And there is also the idea that you could get involved with EGU. Perhaps you yourself would like to be a division representative or to be involved with some of the committees. Then I recommend that you attend the short course on how to get involved in EGU. As I mentioned, there are some career development opportunities um, that are specifically tailored for early career scientists who are um, perhaps thinking about what in which direction they want to take their career path. And one of these short courses is careers inside and outside of academia, a panel discussion, and that is convened by myself on Wednesday the 21st at 4pm. There are many, many different short courses, not just the ones that me and Chloe have both listed here, but others as well, including ones that are specifically tailored for skill development in data analysis, software, um, designing your research portfolio and other things like that. So take a look on the programme with the SC tag. Um, and so you can filter out your results. Then there are two great debates which are of potential interest for early career scientists. The first one is a panel discussion on slow versus fast science. And so this is going to cover the theme of things like how often you should publish, or is there this idea that you should be publishing a lot of papers but with a smaller impact versus papers not so often um, with a higher impact. And then the second one is a roundtable discussion where you'll be broken up into um, different um, Zoom breakout rooms and you can have a, a discussion amongst yourselves about bullying in academia towards creating a healthy and safe working environment. Now, at a normal conference, there are norm, like 
lots and lots of networking events. You know, you are attending perhaps ones that are organized, but also you bump into somebody in a session and you decide to go out for food or drinks, and then it becomes kind of a networking event. And we wanted to bring this kind of more in-person um, attitude to the online conference this year. And so firstly, there are a number of organized networking events, both in the division and outside of the divisions. And these are mostly going to use GatherTown or Zoom. And you can have a look at all of them by looking at the net and ET tab on the um, filter for the program. Specifically, the ones that I'll run through here are some division networking events. So each division will have two networking events. Firstly, an early career science specific event where you can meet other people who are um, early career scientists and your peers. And then there is a second event which is open for all division members, um, regardless of your career stage. And if you check the program, you can find your division specific event. There are also events tailored for early career scientists in every division. So the ECS union wide networking event and also the ECS forum. And the ECS forum is a way for you to interact with your division and early career science representatives and hear the changes that have been made in the last few years. And you can put forward some ideas um, for things we can work on in the next few years. There's also EGU wide events, such as the first time attendee icebreaker can be a little bit daunting to enter a Zoom call with people you don't know. And so if you are aware that other people are also new to EGU conferences, perhaps that might make it a bit easier. So the first time attendee icebreaker is on the Monday morning, um, Monday lunchtime. And I recommend that you attend that if you've not been to a EGU conference before. Then there are also some pop-up events. Um, this scheduler should come live in the next few days. Um, and this is a way for you to create your own networking event. Anybody who's registered can um, create their own networking event and you'll just need to link to something like Zoom or whatever account that you use. Um, so keep your eyes peeled in the next few days for some information about that. Then there are other networking events which are more general or not scientific um, socializing, but more general socializing. One of these is the EGU Pride event where you can meet other members of the LGBTQIA plus community and allies. And then there is also the Geoscience Games Night and the Rhyme Your Research where you can create some science communication from your results. In terms of career development and job opportunities at the conference, we now will have a specific job and career area or part of the virtual um, uh, interface. And so on this area, you can go to find out all the information about careers. One of the events is meet the exhibitors and we're just still organizing what day this will, will happen. So um, keep looking back at Twitter for more information, but this is where you will be paired with an exhibitor. So for instance, someone from a journal, um, someone from a data instrument company, and you can ask for some um, specific career information if you're interested in going down that route. Then there is also the meet the talent elevator pitches. And this is where you can create a two minute short video, basically pitching yourself to a potential job um, job employer, to a potential employer. Um, so a two minute video, some examples will be available on the YouTube channel um, in a few days. Um, and there will also be a blog post this week to give you a bit more information about this. On your profile, um, you can also add a number of buttons or um, stickers to your profile this year. And one of those is ask for my CV. So if you are looking for a job and you would like to um, give your CV to somebody, um, that's the way you can do it. And so this is the profile, that, um, just an example of my profile to show you what I mean. Um, at the top of the registration page is a my profile button. And then you can add these stickers here. And there is also one for um, ask for my CV. Finally, there is an art um, project that happens every year, usually in-person conferences. It's in combination with the, um, the kids, um, what is it called? It's not babysitting, but where the kids go for their daycare. Um, and to, we wanted to continue this. So we now have the EGU Art Kids program. And this year, the theme is Extreme Earth. And so in the last 12 months, there's been a lot of extreme weather events and um, phenomenon happening. For instance, right now, part of Iceland, um, there's a volcanic eruption. It was a record breaking hurricane season, different things like this. And so we want um, your child or you, if you are particularly arty, to get creative and send us your creations. Um, in the past, it's mostly been painting, but really you can use whatever material you have at hand. Take a photo of your creation and you can send that to ecs-nh at edu.eu because the Natural Hazards Division is running this event. Or you can tweet it with the hashtag EGUArtKids 
um, hashtag and then we will retweet it. At the end of the conference, we'll put them all together into a nice colorful blog post so that you can see your child or your creations for eternity. And that's all from me. So I'll pass you back to Simon. Hello, yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, I just want to quickly reiterate that if you have a question, simply to click on the Q&A tab below, type it in and we'll get around to it after everyone is speaking. Uh, I just want to introduce our final speaker, uh, who is Kelly Stanford. He is one of our artists in residence, or I suppose not in residence, given it's virtual, uh, and also one of the conveners for the Science and Arts EOS events. Uh, yeah, so Kelly, we'd like to take away and discuss uh, your artistry. Hi, so I am the main convener for Exploring the Art Science Interface, EOS 7.4. Um, basically, this session is an amazing hybrid session combining both science, science communication and art. So the idea around this was to try and give like a level playing field to both science papers and to the art that they may uh, contain, because there's a lot of overlap in the science communication uh, community of using art as a um, tool for science communication in various projects and such. So we just wanted to better represent that uh, in a dedicated EOS session. And luckily we had an amazing turnout so originally we had 30 abstracts submitted which have been weaned down to 28 so as you can imagine it's quite a long session spanning from 9 a.m to 12 30 uh, on wednesday the 28th of april so it essentially it takes up two time blocks but it's quality all the way through like we've got amazing papers like i've just been scrolling for him just to like refresh the mind and <laughs> we've got people making science quilts we've got people who've done photography projects on astrophotography uh we've got people who've been using like music to express various uh geoscience topics uh so we'll be running that on wednesday the 28th and throughout, we'll also be highlighting various artworks in sectional blocks. So people can submit from outside the uh, session their own sci art, and we can highlight and discuss it uh, in these two minute sections throughout. Also, we are, uh, we are organizing some panels as well to uh, be hosted before EGU. So, can, well, so people um, displaying their work and uh, displaying their abstracts at this session can have a formal discussion online discussing how they use art and science together, um, what their experiences are with it and what their personal uh, opinions are uh, on the matter. We'll also be having various social breakout rooms such as Animal Crossing, we've actually created an entire science island dedicated to EGU this year. So there'll be rooms where people can jump in, explore places, and there'll be like a treasure map as well. So people can find various hidden Easter eggs throughout the island as just, you know, something to break the ice and something to do for our um, EGU this year. Also, as mentioned, I'm the artist in residence this year. So I've already started creating some portraits, mainly of those participating in the great debate. I'm currently looking for more people to do portraits of. So I'm do currently doing an open call for conveners of sessions at EGU who want their portrait doing. So if you message me at the lab artist on Twitter, I can take your details down, look into what research you do, and if it's interesting enough, no pressure, I will um, turn your portrait into a science and art portrait. So basically your portrait will be combined with your scientific research in a visual manner. And that's totally free of charge. I'm not looking for anything for doing that. It's part of the artist residency. Um, 
I'm also doing the EDI uh, scientist coloring book. So basically a group of us on the EDI team are putting together a coloring book of EGU participants. So we're literally like making uh, line art illustrations of scientists in their work field, like, on, like in the field, like working, um, you know, next to volcanoes, next to like the lab spaces and such. I think it's a really, really nice initiative. And we're also accepting uh, requests for that as well. So as with the scientist portraits, if you know someone who you'd like to be represented or if you, you, you yourself would like to be represented in this EDI coloring book, uh, please just drop me a message on Twitter uh, and I can get back to you there. Thank you, Kelly. The Animal Crossing Edu Island sounds uh, really enticing and incredible. Um, <laughs> sorry, I want to reiterate, if you have a request for Kelly in terms of poetry or a um, drawing for her book, um, you can visit her Twitter at uh, The Lab Artist, that The Lab Artist on Twitter. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, questions. Um, coming in, um, I think the first one I have is for Clary, which is for attendees interested in science policy, but who are unsure where to begin or even what questions to ask, how should they best approach the conference? Um, which I guess could be summarized as where's the best place to start if you're interested in science policy? Sorry, I meet myself. Um, yeah, so I think the best place to start, start is probably the short courses. Um, the short courses, like I said, will really give an overview of what science or policy is to start with. They won't have any knowledge assumed. Um, and that will give you some, some idea of what science or policy is, but also what opportunities actually exist for scientists to engage. And once you have that foundation, a lot of the other sessions like the Union Symposia um, won't necessarily make more sense, but you will be able to connect the dots a little bit better about, okay, what does this mean in terms of science or policy? What does this mean in terms of scientists engaging more in the in the policy making process? Um, so yeah, definitely recommend um, attending a few of the, the short courses that I mentioned. And I did actually put the link to that in the chat as well. So you can have a look at the blog with all of the, all of the sessions I mentioned just there. Um, but I would also recommend going to some of the networking sessions as well. So I mentioned these will be a little bit more informal um, but it will give you the chance to hear other people speak about their own experiences and also talk with other people who are just getting started themselves. Um, so, yeah. And, and again, if you have any, like, if you, if you would like to participate in that um, Ask an Expert uh, activity as well, you're more than welcome to, even as someone who doesn't have any prior experience or knowledge, um, that's actually, if, if you have a question, it's very general, that is a, an easier question to answer for the person that you'll be matched with. So don't hesitate to apply for that either. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Um, our next question is for Jenny. Uh, and it's just asking for people looking to get involved in kids art, uh, who should they contact? Yeah, so the Natural Hazards Division are organising the event, but also in combination with the Cryosphere Division, which is the division that I am part of. Um, so the best thing to do is to either email um, the Natural Hazards or the Cryosphere account, which is ecs-cr um, or nh at egu.eu. Um, so that's the main email account. Um, if you want, you can also um, find me on Twitter um, and drop me an email there if the um, email account is, yeah, if I've said it wrong or yeah, you'd rather just have an informal chat, then you can find me on Twitter, that's fine. Excellent, uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, another question for you uh, was, for the jobs and careers events, um, how can ECS or any other people looking for jobs and careers um, help themselves stand out um, for future employers? I think this was, Kind of relating to that um, pairing scheme as well. Just want to ask more about how that is going to work. 
Yeah, sure. So I think um, one of the ways that you can definitely um, stand out is by trying to attend one or two of the sessions where there are going to be potential job um, opportunities or future employers. Um, so the Meet the Talent um, is where you can upload your own two minute video, um, which exhibitors can look at. But if you also attend the Meet the Exhibitor event, you could maybe meet them um, one on one in a, in a Zoom uh, breakout room so that you can talk to them. And I think when someone can put a face to a name, it really helps for um, remembering who someone is in future job opportunities. For instance, if you then applied with them a little bit later on. Um, you could also attend any of the short courses that are about um, the careers events and hopefully we'll have some more informal pop-up events after those um, so that then you can approach somebody um, in that way as well. Excellent. Um, thanks, Jenny. Um, Kelly, I have a question for you. Um, and it's asking, how should attendees looking perhaps to start off in science art or who are interested in even collaboration, um, where do you think they should start out? There's a lot of events, they all sound really great, but um, where's the first place to go to if uh, you've not really engaged with so, um, so um, art? Well, I recommend attending our session um, as that's a good start, because then you get a, general ideas for different mediums and such and different ways to collaborate on these projects. Cause like I mentioned, we have such a wide range, like just looking through the program, which I've linked in the chat. Um, yeah, that will give you a few ideas, but mainly it's just, it's just talking to scientists and artists and just opening the dialogue between the two and just figuring out you know, as you go along, there's no right or wrong way to start doing sci art. Um, so yeah, I, I would just recommend, you know, network as much as possible, just like look into different projects that have happened before and then think, how can I take my scientific subject and possibly, you know, combine it with art? And I would highly recommend discussing this with artists because they might have, you know, different insight on how to do this excellent so I, I guess that means just look through the program and if there's something that draws you go to that and that's the best way to kind of engage in site art um if you're not sure where to start but if you're looking to um build your own skills find the artists and talk to them directly is the best way to do it yeah, I mean, like networking, like doesn't hurt, uh, hurt. But if you want a, well, if you're a scientist wanting to make your own site art, I would recommend still going to artists, discussing what mediums they use, and also just experimenting with different mediums as well, because different people have different things that they like. I mean, just because I do digital illustration mainly doesn't mean that everyone else will enjoy you know, using that area, you can use like sculpture, you can use textiles, like there's like so many different options. So I would just say, you know, dive straight in and explore. Sure, that sounds, that's good advice. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, I have a couple more questions left. Uh, this one's uh, for you, Chloe, and they're just asking how formal or informal are these one-on-one um, -on -one meetings? I mean, it's really up to you <laughs> and the questions that you ask. I, I would say that they're probably going to be pretty informal. Like the experts that I know, I, I know quite well. Um, and most of our conversations are relatively informal. And actually, I think you'll find if you ever engage with a policymaker directly, that communication after the initial emails can also be quite informal in itself as well. Um, so it would be me doing the coordination of it for example, setting up the Zoom session and, and emailing you the times and making sure that both, both people within that, um, within that pair can actually meet at that time. Um, but after that, you know, you can email them afterwards. You can, um, yeah, really chat about anything. Um, and if you submit a couple of questions and then you, you think of some others afterwards, that's also fine. Um, the important thing is just to submit the questions now um make sure you know I can actually have the time to pair you up and then if you think of others before your actual meeting with the person which again it's only 15 minutes um you can also ask those as well excellent um so if people go to these events and think of questions after the fact 
um, how should they best uh, relay those questions? Should we perhaps contact you? Should we try and make a lasting connection with your policy advisors? What should we do? Yeah, I mean, it depends. If you feel a connection or if you click with the person that you're meeting with, absolutely. Um, if you have any questions and either you decided to not do the, the meeting with the one-on-one the -on -one meeting with someone, or um, you just rather email me, you can absolutely email me any questions that you have. Um, I do get quite a few emails from different people. Just, I mean, some of them I can't answer myself and I can just give some direction. Um, and some I'm, more, I'm, I'm able to answer more concretely. You can email me, my email is policy at egu.eu. I'll also just put that in the chat as well. Um, or alternatively, if you want to just keep up with what's happening in Europe in terms of science and policy, you can also sign up for the monthly newsletter that I send out. Um, and you can do that by joining the database of expertise. And I'll also link that in the chat. I'll also send you the link, Simon, so you can add them to the, the YouTube description. Um, thank you very much, Zoe. Um, and Jenny, I think the final question uh, relates, is similar, but relates to ECS is, Someone who's engaged engages with ECS content at the conference and is looking to uh, continue to do so afterwards. Like how best do they go about it? Yeah, I think the first step would be contacting your um, division representative. So, um, yeah, say you're in the atmospheric science division, you can speak directly to your um, division representative using the same email as the ones I've put in the chat there. So, depending on uh, which division you're in. Um, and that, that's always useful um, because they can also link you with somebody else if you are interested in being involved in the Equality, Diversion and Inclusion Committee, for instance, they will be able to point you into the right direction. Um, most of the division representatives are also checking their Twitter account, so you can also feel free to drop the, um, the respective EGU division um, and, uh, a tweet, and I think that should be fine. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions I have for today. I think that's a good time to wrap up the session. So first I want to thank you all the attendees for coming and watching this webinar. Thank you our speakers uh, for delivering all that information. I should note there's also a lot more other content out there than just mentioned there today. For example, uh, there's the Imagio um, Science Photography uh, Competition. So make sure when you're attending, you also put your votes for a photo. Um, but otherwise, uh, I will see you in 11 days. Thank you very much for attending.